Hello everyone, I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Before we get started, I would like to thank the native of this town that gave me the idea to do this story. I really appreciate it and it's a very, very interesting topic and I think we all will really enjoy this one. Um, It's a sad topic, but it's good to know history and events that took place. And it's very, very interesting to know, you know, how one thing led to the other. I didn't know that about this particular story, and I think you all would find it just as interesting. So with that being said, um, today we're going to talk about um, a small town called Camilla, Georgia, and it's deep, dark history. Now, this is a deep and dark hidden history that has been hidden all the way up until 1998. This is going to be about the history of the Camilla Massacre. But before we talk about the Camilla Massacre and Camilla, I would like to give you all a little history about the town and how it came to be. Now, Camilla is a small town within Mitchell County. Mitchell County was formed from Baker County through an act of Georgia legislator, Legislature, I'm sorry, I always mess up that word. Y'all know how my accent is. I apologize. On December 21st of 1857, it's the state's 123rd county. Now, Mitchell County was named after Henry Mitchell, a general in the Revolutionary War, or David B. Mitchell, who served twice as Georgia's governor in the early 1800s. Now, I use the term or because no one actually knows which of the two it was named after, but it was definitely named after one of these gentlemen, according to history. Now, Camilla was incorporated in 1858, one year after the founding of Mitchell County. The town was named after General Henry Mitchell's 19-year-old granddaughter, Miss Camilla Mitchell. So now that we have discussed how Camilla came to be, Let's go ahead and discuss the chain of events that led to the Camilla Massacre. After the Civil War, Georgia underwent a reconstruction from 1865 to 1871. During this reconstruction period, a state's constitution was framed under the leadership of Herschel Johnson by delegates of constitutional, I'm sorry, by delegates of the Constitutional Convention. This state constitution repealed the ordinance of secession, it abolished slavery, and it repudiated the Confederate dead. Now, in layman terms, they basically revoked the order that withdrew the state from the Union. More than 400,000 African Americans were free from slavery, and they refused to accept the Confederate dead. Now, few changes were actually made to the Constitution of 1861. However, a few major alterations were made. Interracial marriages were prohibited and governorship terms were limited to two years. In early December of 1865, the Georgia General Assembly ratified the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which ended slavery. Now, with the slaves free, Many farms and plantations that depended on slave labor suffered tremendously. And as a result of poor planting and no longer having slaves, the harvest became small until many of them diminished altogether. Many of the newly freed black Georgians, they flocked to the overcrowded towns. And in those towns, they suffered from diseases and food shortages. Now, to make matters even worse or even more complicated, Rumors started to spread, which suggested the free men would soon be given freeholds and plowing animals. Now, freeholds, from what I found out or what I looked up, it's pretty much where they were given pieces of land or property that would be held by a permanent tenure. So with that being said, this is how the term 40 acres and a mule came to be. Now, in January of 1865, the Union General, William T. Sherman, he issued a special field order number 15 from Savannah, Georgia. He ordered federal authorities to confiscate any abandoned lands along the coast and distribute them to the free people. Now, this distribution didn't really last long. It was pretty much temporary, and most of the land was soon returned to its original owners. However, Some of the black families were able to buy or lease land from the government. 
by the fall of 1865, most of the formerly enslaved men returned to the fields as labor workers with the contract labor system between them and the white land owners. Now, many of the black women and children, they went ahead and withdrew from the fields and they worked in the households and they took advantage of the educational opportunities that were offered to them from the North teachers or teachers of the North. Now, at that time, also, all black churches began to arise and characterize the Reconstruction as well. Now, the white Georgians, they greatly disapproved of the many changes um, and with white supremacy still prevalent at that time, the free people were still not looked at as citizens or voters. However, the free people, they were provided practical civil equality, and that's where um, they were provided access to the courts and the ability to make contracts and to sue or be sued. They were provided property rights um, where they were able to buy, sell, inherit, and lease both lands and per- and personal property. And they were not to be subjected to any punishment or penalty that, that did not apply to whites as well. And their marriages and children were pretty much legitimized at that time. So they started to recognize their children and their marriages in the eyes of the laws at that time as well. Now, they were given several rights, um, but some very important rights were still denied at that time, of course. So they didn't have the right to serve as a juror. They didn't have the right to vote or the right to testify against whites in courts. But by March of 1868, 169 convention delegates, including 37 blacks, framed a new state constitution. And that constitution included a provision for black voting. In April of 1868, there were 29 black Republicans within the House and three black Republicans within the Senate. There was major controversy during this time, which led to the creation of three major groups within history. Of course, you know, with all of that going on and having black people actually sitting in the House and the Senate, it was definitely going to spark some controversy. And that controversy birthed three major groups in history. Those three major groups are known as the Carpetbaggers, Scalawags, and the Ku Klux Klan. Now, I always mess that word up a little bit, but y'all know how my accent is and all of that, so just bear with me, please. Now, the term carpetbaggers and scalawags, they were coined by the white conservatives to describe the two major groups of white Republicans allied with the far more numerous black Republicans. So at this time, there were more black Republicans than white Republicans. Now, the carpetbaggers were northerners who came south After the war to seek their fortune through politics, if they were a resident within a southern state for at least a year, they gained voting and office rights. Now, the Scalawags, they were the southern born white Republicans or any white Republican who lived in the south before the war. And the term Ku Klux Klan, that term was created for the terroristic wing of the Democratic Party. They were known as the Knight Riders who acted to suppress the Republicans of all races and origins. Now, the Ku Klux Klan, their debut in Georgia was the Ashburn killing in Columbus on the Grand Dragon, Jordan. I'm sorry, John B. Gordon. The Ashburn killing was the murder of George W. Ashburn, and he was a radical Republican who was assassinated by the Ku Klux Klan in Columbus, Georgia, for his pro-African-American sentiments. On the night of March the 30th, 1868, Ashburn participated at a huge gathering of blacks and Republicans at the Temperance Hall in Columbus, Georgia. After midnight, Ashburn, well, it was around midnight or after midnight, Ashburn was murdered at a house on the corner of 13th Avenue and 21st by a group of five well-dressed men wearing masks. He was the first victim of the Ku Klux Klan in Georgia. The Ku Klux Klan is better known as the KKK. Now, black Republicans, particularly their leaders, they served as the principal target of the Klan. Now, arguably, among those to, that they were targeting were Henry McNeil Turner and Tunis Campbell. Now, both of these men, 
Turner and Campbell, they served as delegates to the Constitutional Convention in 1868, and they were elected into legislature in July of 1868. Now, consequently to that, in July of 1868, the General Assembly's Democrats and their white Republican allies also began a campaign to expel the black legislature. Now, in September of 1868 a few months later after they had been elected and the same month that they were elected turner and campbell i'm talking about the white democrats and their republican white allies were trying to have them expelled now in september of 1868 shortly after turner and campbell were removed from the legislative body in addition to them being removed 28 newly elected members were expelled also because they were at least one eighth black. Not saying they were like, we can obviously see that they were black, but because they had one eighth of black, you know, in their genes and in their genetics and all that stuff and in their makeup, they were expelled as well, along with the black people that were in the legislative body. Now, among those that were expelled or removed was Southwest Georgia Representative Philip Joyner. Now, on September, um, on September 19th, 1868, Joyner, along with Northerners Francis F. Putney, and I'm going to look it up and see if um, there's another little town called Putney, Georgia. I'm going to look it up to see if he had anything to do with that or if it was named after him. I'm going to do a follow-up on this story because I also want to know if what we're going to talk about led to another event in Camilla, but we'll talk about that in the end. But anyway, as I was saying, on September 19th, 1868, Joyner, along with Northerners Francis F. Putney and William P. Pierce, they led a 25-mile march of several hundred blacks and a few whites from Albany, Georgia to Camilla, Georgia. And this was where the Mitchell County seat is. Now, they led them to attend a Republican political rally. And with that being said, that's going to take us on to, you know, what we what we're waiting on, what we're here for. So with that being said, Mitchell County whites, they were determined to ensure that no Republican rally rally would occur. They were going to do all they could to stop that rally from happening. And this is what led to the Camilla massacre. First, I'm going to give you all the generic version of what happened during the massacre. Then I'm going to read an actual affidavit of John Murphy's. He was present during the massacre. And I'm also going to read the affidavit of F.F. Putney and the letter written from Atlanta, Georgia to Major General Oliver Otis, Otis Howard in Washington, D.C. All of these were written in 1868, right after the massacre. Now, I'm also going to put the affidavits up on the screen as I read them page by page. So that way you all can actually see the actual affidavits um, while I read them. And you all can try to read along, but they're pretty hard to see. But anyway, so as we said, the Mitchell County Whites, they were determined to ensure that no rally was going to pl take place. No way, no how. They were going to do anything in their power to stop it. So the Whites... They stationed in various storefronts around the town or around the town square. And as the marchers entered the courthouse square in Camilla, they opened fire on those marchers, the whites that were stationed around. And they wound up killing over a dozen marchers and wounding possibly 30 others. Now, as the marchers fled back to Albany to try and avoid the attack, the hostile whites assaulted them for several miles. Now, the news of the Camilla massacre flashed over telegraph wires and the newspapers all across the nation reported on it. This particular violence, of course, it intimidated the people. It intimidated the African-Americans so much with some of them to where they stayed in the house during election day. They didn't even go out to vote. They were so scared because of what happened during the massacre. And as this was going on, Camilla and Albany, Georgia, the white leaders, they were committing fraud at the voting at the voting polls. They were deliberately misplacing black votes 
or they were changing them to Democratic ones. Now, with that being said, the white Democrats, you know, they were the racial minority in the South, in Southwest Georgia at that time. They pretty much now carry the elections. So let's go ahead and read what happened actually at the massacre for someone who was there. Now, he's going to describe what happened from beginning to end. And as I said, I'm going to put the affidavit up. You all can see the actual thing while I read what he's saying in the affidavit. And they talked a little different when this letter was written or this affidavit was written. So you all, please bear with me. You know, I have my accent and it's going to be some of it's going to be pretty hard to read or understand. So let's go ahead and pull up this affidavit. And see what Mr. Murphy witnessed. Now, this affidavit, um, the description of it is saying that on September the 22nd. So the actual massacre took place on September the 19th. So this affidavit was written up September the 22nd night. I'm sorry, 1868. And the massacre took place on September the 19th, 1868. So the sub assistant commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau in Georgia, Brevet Major O. H. Howard, writes this affidavit taken from John Murphy, a Republican elector and one of the organizers of the political rally that was to be held in Camilla. So he was actually an organizer of this rally on September the nineteenth of eighteen sixty eight. Now, the, this affidavit is Murphy's account of the violence that broke out between freed men who entered the town, or freed slaves rather. They entered the town together with Republicans and the town's people who opposed them. Murphy includes details from the events leading up to the incident, including his initial encounter with Mitchell County Sheriff Mumford S. Poor. It's P-O-O-R-E. Through the incident itself and its aftermath. So let's go ahead and pull it up real quick. Like I said, you all just bear with me. And we're going to do it page by page. Okay, so page one. Georgia State, Doherty County. Personally appeared before me, John Murphy, who being duly sworn says that on the morning of September the 19th instant or I and William P. Pierce started in a buggy from Albany, Georgia to Camilla, Georgia. At which place we were to address the citizens according to the notice which had been printed and circulated through Mitchell County for five or six days before. A band of music destined for the same place and occasion left Albany on the evening of the 18th. We overtook this band in music about four miles of Camilla together with quite a number of free people who had been attracted to the road by the music and who were then en route for the place of speaking this number continued to the argument until we reached Camilla. Numbering then in all men, women, and children, about 200. In about one and a half miles from Camilla, we were met by the sheriff of Mitchell County, Mr. Poor, and several men. Who? And we're going to stop there. So basically what he's saying is that him, General Pierce, and men, women, and children, it was about 200 of them, including a band and all, um, they were headed to Camilla to talk with them about the notice that they had already previously given them five or six days ago about this Republican rally. So it looks like they were coming in peace. They just wanted to talk to them, but we're going to see what happens. I'm not going to speak for it. We're going to read it together. And so it's saying that as they got there, about a mile and a half away from Camilla, they were met by the sheriff and several other men. And so now let's read further. Now we're on page two. So they're saying the sheriff and those other men who met them before they got into Camilla 
They represent themselves as a delegation sent out to meet them by the citizens of Camilla to protest them entering the town unless they would um the freedmen who were following the music along the road would stack their arms so unless they would put down their guns. Now it's saying that one out of three of these freedmen had shotguns. Now this protest was made under the governor's proclamation forbidding armed organizations. Now, he's saying that he tried to convince them that this was not an armed organization, that each man who had a gun was carrying it in accordance to the right he had to do so under the Constitution of the state. Captain Pierce and this young man told them positively that no one order that no order had been given to these freed men to carry their guns to Camilla, that they carried them of their own will respectively. And they knew it was a custom over the whole country with freed men to carry their guns wherever they went. These gentlemen manifested great uneasiness about the safety of Camilla. If these freed men were suffered to enter the towns with arms, Captain Pierce and him, they gave them every assurances of their peaceful intentions, and that's the rights. So, basically, what he's saying here on page two, Mr. Murphy, he's saying that they were trying to explain to them because one third of the men had shotguns. But what they were trying to explain to the sheriff and the men that met them was that they meant no harm. They were coming in peace. They were not an armed organization. They were just carrying their guns because at that time, pretty much almost every man carried his gun across the country. So they were carrying guns because everyone was doing that at that time across the country. It was not to harm anyone or do anything to the people of the town of Camilla. It was just simply because everyone was carrying their guns at those times. So they were pretty much trying to reassure them of their peaceful intentions. So they're saying now on page three, that the rights of the people of Camilla in person or property were in no danger, whatever of being molested by the colored people. And finally, for the purpose of allying their fears. And he's saying that he proposed to have their speaking at Dr. Dasher's about a half a mile from Camilla on the road that they were traveling. This proposition was agreed to by these gentlemen, one of them saying, well, we will let you speak there. These gentlemen then left us riding toward Camilla. Captain Pierce remarked at the time that if Dr. Dasher objected to them speaking on his premises, they would then speak at the courthouse in Camilla. When they reached Dr. Dasher, they applied for permission to speak on his premises, and he objected. They then addressed a note to the sheriff stating that Dr. Dasher had refused to let them speak on the premises. And when they addressed that letter, hold on. When they addressed that letter, it was sent by a colored man on a horseback, um, but before he had gone far, he met the sheriff who was returning back to them. And a conversation then ensued between the captain, Captain Pierce, and the sheriff. And what he's saying is that he, Mr. Murphy, he did not hear that conversation that happened between Captain Pierce and the sheriff. Now, just to break this paragraph down or this page down, rather, what he's pretty much saying is that after they had been met by them and everything, they were saying that they were intentionally going to speak at Dr. Dasher's and give their speech and have their rally and everything at Dr. Dasher's, which was about a half a mile from Camilla. Um, it was on the road that they were traveling. 
But they said that if he denied them to speak on his property, then they would speak at the courthouse. So, of course, when they got there to Dr. Dasher, he did deny them to speak on his property and he objected to them speaking on his property. So that's when they decided, OK, as they said, if they couldn't speak there, they were going to go to the courthouse to speak there. So instead of just going to the courthouse, they wrote up a letter and they sent it by a colored man to take it to the sheriff to let him know that they were denied um, access to speak at Dr. Dasher's. So they were headed to the courthouse to speak for the rally. Now, before the black man or the colored man can get into town with the letter, the sheriff met him because the sheriff was returning back to the group. And when the sheriff met them, the sheriff had a, com- a conversation with Captain Pierce. Um, but however, the conversation that the sheriff had with Captain Pierce, Murphy, the guy who actually wrote this letter, he did not hear that conversation. So he's saying after that conversation happened, well, page four now, he then proceeded to Camilla, well, they then proceeded to Camilla, and not as an armed organization, but peacefully following after the music. Remember, I said it was a band with them. You know, little dreaming that an armed organization was awaiting our arrival for the purpose of murdering us. Captain Pierce and Mr. Putney entered the town about 200 yards in advance of the crowd. They entered for the purpose of allying the fears of the citizens, which from the representations of their delegates, we thought were aroused by false representation of our motives and purposes. Mr. Putney told the freed men to scatter out along the road, not to enter the town in a body for fear of alarming people of the place. Thus, we entered the town in the most perfect quiet upon entering to my utter astonishment. That's what Murphy's saying. I discovered two different crowds of men arranged in such position as to crossfire over the public square armed with guns. I then, and not till then, realized that the fact that the vague reports among the freed men that the Democrats intended to attack us. So the people who were attacking them, they're saying that they were Democrats. So let's break this paragraph down. So basically what he's saying is that they entered Camilla not as an armed organization or to mean them any harm, but they entered peacefully with the band following the music and all of that good stuff. Um, They weren't even thinking of walking into an ambush. They had no idea that armed organizations were going to be awaiting their arrival. So when they got into Camilla, the captain Pierce and Mr. Putney, they went ahead of them to lead them in. Now, little did they know that and they were thinking that they were going to ease the people's mind let them know they come in peace and all that good stuff and kumbaya but little did they know the people of camilla wasn't here for it they weren't going for it so they were already arranged in a firing position all across the town square or the public square they were armed and they were ready so with that being said they walked into an ambush and didn't even know it so let's go on to page five now, page five, they're saying they didn't know that they intended to attack them. And they alluded to hand their they alluded um, to had fired. And until the volley had been fired by the crowd, it is true. And some of it's just in the document was damaged and all of that. Um, The store and the volley from the Negroes was close together, but that from the Former was a little in advance and about the same time a fire was opened from the crowd of Democrats already mentioned on the south side of the square. I estimated the crowd of Democrats on the west side of the square at 50 men. I could not see enough of the crowd on the south side to make a correct estimate of the number. So it was a little hard to interpret the beginning of this paragraph or the beginning of this page five but from what i'm gathering is um once they you know got into town and all of that they didn't know they were going to attack them but then they began to open fire on the crowd 
And when he looked, Mr. Murphy, he could see that there was 50 men on the west side, but it was so much of a crowd on the south side, he couldn't even see or make a correct estimate as to how many men was over there. So it was a lot of Camilla natives um, or people of Mitchell County that were um, in on that attack. So, of course, under this gaining and unexpected fire, the Negroes fled. The fire from the crowd on the south side of the square was mainly directed at Captain Pierce and Mr. Putney, who were standing in the portico of the courthouse. As I have since been informed, as the bullet mass on the courthouse proved, Captain Pierce, Mr. Putney, Mr. Joyner, and myself attempted to rally those of the freedmen who had guns in the bottom behind some undergrowth on the north side of town. So they're saying pretty much that, or he's saying, Mr. Murphy, he's saying that um, the fire that was um, all going to, were pretty much when all the fire broke out, all of the freed men or the Negroes, they started to flee. Now, the fire from the crowd on the south side, they were directing that mainly at Captain Pierce and Mr. Putney. Because remember, they went ahead and they were standing in the middle of the courthouse, rather. I guess that's what the portico is. So, as that happened, they were trying to actually um, rally the freed men who had the guns to, I guess, help out or help them get out of it. Let's see. Let's read further. Let's go to page six. So they were behind some undergrowth on the north side of town and not for the purpose of renewing the fight because they had such desire to fight, but for the purpose of retreating compactly and holding the mob back from murdering the men, women and children who were unarmed and scattered and fleeing. But in this, we were unsuccessful after the first fire, all the free saving no more than six or eight, were unarmed, having no ammunition to load with. Delay of any kind was found to be an evil, and each man took care of himself. Captain Pierce and Mr. Putney, with quite a number of freed men, escaped by the way of Thomasville Road through the woods on foot. Walking about 30 miles that night and reaching the residence of Mr. William W. Fish, a Staunch Republican about daylight next morning. So from what I'm gathering from this paragraph is that the freed men, they were um behind some undergrowth on the north side of town, but not because they were like fighting and that was their strategy and all of that good stuff and everything. But they were trying to actually help the other men, women and children that were unarmed that were trying to scatter and flee. But like I said, they was unsuccessful at doing that. So um, everyone just started scattering and fleeing and all of that stuff. The captain um, and Mr. Putney, they fled through the woods on Thomasville Road and all of that. And they wound up um, reaching the residence of a Republican the next morning. Now, Mr. Joyner and Mr. Murphy, they escaped in a buggy back the, on the road that they came. Now, amid the conflicting reports, it is impossible to make a correct estimate of the killed. Now, we're going to pause right there. So that sentence was from page six, continuing to page seven. So what he's pretty much saying is Mr. Murphy, he's saying that him and Mr. Joyner, they escaped in a buggy back to the way on the road that they came. They went back in the same way direction that they came. Now, amid all of the conflict, it was so much. They don't really know or they can't give a correct estimate of how many people died or how many people was wounded. So the number that I'm giving in this actual um, video is not the actual number because it was so much chaos and all of that. No one actually knows. And I'm pretty sure a lot of bodies were cleaned up and covered up before any of them were counted. So we know that the number is going to be off some kind of way. So but anyway, back to what we we're saying. He's saying that they couldn't even estimate the number of killed or the number wounded, but he feel confident that it was pretty much only 15 or 20 people that were killed. See, he said 15 or 20, so he really doesn't know, and about 40 wounded. 
Now, he's saying that only two of the free men were actually killed um, under contrary. Let's see what it's saying. It's saying, on the contrary, notwithstanding, only two of the free men were killed in the middle of the town. Where all of the residents, uh, you know, and part of the free men were made. And it's saying that all the balance were followed up and shot down as they fled across the fields and woods. Peter Hines, and it's saying some of the texts were deleted. Um, now it's saying the colored... The leader of the band, he was wounded, and all of the numbers of the band, they were either killed or wounded. Mr. Putney, he was wounded in the arm. Um, Mr. Murphy, he was wounded in the head. Captain Pierce, he was um a, a very small man, small in size, but he went unhurt. Several bullet holes were in his clothing, however, so God was with him. He was very, very lucky. I don't know how he had bullet holes in his clothing, but he didn't get hit. But Captain Pierce walked away unscathed. Now, one expression made by the sheriff to Mr. Murphy is that they received a dispatch from Albany that morning that the crowd or the Republicans were coming to Camilla with an armed force for no good purpose. Now, so let's break down this page right here. So page seven is pretty much saying that Mr. Murphy says he feels confident that there were only 15 or 20 people that were killed and about 40 were wounded. Were wounded I'm sorry. And he's also saying that out of those that were killed, only two of them were killed in the actual town of Camilla. The others were killed as they were fleeing away from Camilla. They were shot down and all of that in the fields and the woods. Now, he's saying that the band leader, he was wounded. Um, all of the band was either killed or wounded. Mr. Putney was wounded in the arm, Mr. Murphy in the head. And like I said, Captain Pierce, Lord was with him. He had bullet holes, but he was not wounded at all. Don't know how that happened, but it happened. Now, with that being said, let's move on to page eight, our last page. So now page eight is saying that Mr. Murphy, the guy who wrote this affidavit, he was made to believe that the people of Camilla were laboring under false representation of their motives and objectives. Now, he's saying that they should, however, have waited until they were guilty of some hostile demonstration before they attempted to kill them or before they ambushed them. And he said after they had given them every assurance of their peaceful intentions, especially do I blame them, let their information have been what it may for the following up the colored people and shooting them. So he's pretty much saying here in page eight that the Camilla, the people of Camilla were given false pretenses or a false representation of their motives and objectives. So they thought that they were coming to do them some harm. They're claiming that they had got a message from Albany that morning saying they were an armed force um, coming there for no good purpose. So it was pretty much they um, had been lied to. Before the people even got there and they just thought that they were coming to harm them. So they felt like they had to protect themselves. So Mr. Murphy is saying, even though they were told that, which I agree with him, even though they were told that no one had tried to harm any of them. They was constantly trying to talk to them. They had tried to show them that they came in peace. And I feel like they shouldn't have attacked those people unless they tried to attack them. There, to me, was no reason to just ambush them the way they did. And in my opinion, that was dead wrong. So that was the um, sworn affidavit by Mr. John Murphy that we just got through reading. And now we are going to jump on to the other two pieces that we have and we're going to wrap it up. So let's go ahead and talk about the affidavit of F.F. F. Putney that was also written in 1868. So let's read the affidavit of F.F. F. Putney and see what he had to say. Now, his affidavit is also dated September the 22nd, 1868. 
and his full name is Francis Flagg Putney. He's one of the Republican organizers of a rally scheduled to be held in Camilla, Georgia on September of September the 19th, 1868. So Mr. Putney was also an organizer. And of course, we've heard his name throughout the entire story. And like I said, um, there will be a part two to this video because um, I would like to find out about some other pieces to this massacre. What I think goes along with it, but we're going to research and find out. However, um, now, O.H. Howard, a sub-assistant commissioner for the Free Mass Bureau in Georgia, records Putney as corroborating fellow Republican John Murphy's account of the violence that broke out when Republicans and the freedmen who a accompanied them met with a opposition from the white townspeople in Camilla. Putney adds his eyewitness accounts of the fire shots fired at Murphy's accounts, as well as what he recalls of the conversation between Murphy and Sheriff Mumford is poor prior to the disorder in the town. So let's see what he had to say. And his affidavit isn't as long. It's pretty short. It's only two little pages so it's going to be pretty short so page one it starts with georgia state doherty county personally appeared ff F. putney who being duly sworn says that the foregoing affidavit of john murphy is to his personal knowledge correct so the affidavit we just read um, from Mr. Murphy, Mr. Putney is corroborating it or he's agreeing and saying everything that Murphy said was tr correct and true. And he's saying that he knows positively that the man who ordered the music to stop did discharge his gun into the bandwagon for he saw him do so before any of the freed men fired. States also that the substance of the conversation which ensued between Captain Pierce and Sheriff Poor just before they entered Camilla was as follows. Captain Pierce remarked that they were fine citizens and had the right to speak at the courthouse and demanded of the sheriff as he was an officer of the law that he maintain the peace on the part of the citizens of Camilla and at the same time assured him that there would be no disorder on the part of the colored people. The sheriff admitted to speak at the courthouse and promised to do all he could to keep peace on part of the citizens. But at the same time, and this is going over to page two, but at the same time, the sheriff, he also expressed a doubt of his ability to do so. So with that being said, and that's pretty much it. And it just goes into his title and all of that. Um, So like I said, it was very, very short. So he's pretty much saying that what John Murphy said was actually correct. And he is positive that one of the Camilla guys or the men from Mitchell County, when he ordered the music to stop, he discharged his gun into the bandwagon before anyone else fired at him or before there was any violence no one had done anything to him he just ordered the music to stop and he fired and it's saying that the conversation that mr murphy didn't hear um with the captain and the sheriff remember we were talking about that earlier murphy didn't hear the conversation with the sheriff and um with the sheriff and captain pierce However, Mr. Putney did, you know, Mr. Putney was very close with Mr. Pierce during this time. So he heard the conversation and he was saying that the conversation was that the captain was trying to tell the sheriff that all of the people in their rally were fine people and they came in peace and they demanded that the sheriff did his part and maintain the peace. However, the sheriff, he was saying that he was double talking them. Basically, he was saying that, oh, he would do all he could to keep the peace. But at the same time, he was saying, well, he didn't know if he really could do so. So it just seems as if I don't think he was really even going to try, but that's just my opinion. You all know on this channel, we'll agree to disagree. So drop your comments. But let's read our last little piece. And this is the letter 
And this is um an Atlanta, Georgia letter that was sent to Major General Oliver Otis Howard of Washington, D.C. So let's read the description and we'll get into it. And it's very, very short. Um, It's pretty much it's shorter than the last one we read. But let's read the description real quick. So it's pretty much saying this letter dated October the 6th, 1868. So they sent this a little time after, you know, everything that happened. And this was sent from Georgia Freedmen's Bureau Assistant Commissioner General Caleb C. Sibley in Atlanta to the Bureau's Commissioner in Washington, D.C. And that commissioner was General Oliver Otis Howard. Now, Sibley tells Howard that he is forwarding the affidavit uh, from the witnesses to the Camilla incident collected by the Georgia Bureau against Kristen Rauschenberg. Now, he also forwards a report by Rauschenberg and a copy of the Albany Daily News with an article pertaining to the incident. Now, Sibley remarks on the unlikelihood of bringing the guilty parties to justice through the Mitchell County authorities and further notes that he is including a private letter from Rauschenberg that is not to be published at Rauschenberg's request, but may be considered as part of his report. So let's read what we got here. Okay, so it's two pages, but let's see what we got. I don't think it's going to be too, too much to read. So on page one, it's starting out with State of Georgia. And it's just giving the title, Office Commissioner, Bureau, and all of that, Atlanta, Georgia. Major. It's just pretty much the normal professional letterhead with the titles and all of that. And then it starts off, General. I have to uh, I have the honor to forward here within the testimony taken by Major Howard and Agent Rauschenberg regarding the riot at Camilla. A copy of report of Agent Rauschenberg giving it is believed a fair and just review of the cause and responsibility for the outrages committed. In addition, I have to report that no action, whatever, has been taken by the civil authorities toward bringing the guilty parties to punishment. No inquest was held upon the bodies, nor investigation. So what this letter is basically saying that at this current time, they're writing them because they are outraged that this crime had been committed, this massacre occurred, and although this massacre occurred, nothing has happened. No one has been charged. No one cares. Um, no one has been even said to be guilty. Um, no one has been punished. There hasn't even been an investigation on what happened. It just appears as if they're trying to wash it under the rug. Now, this is what page one is saying. Now, let's go to page two. So it's saying, nor investigation, nor investigation has been had. Now, except by this bureau and by Captain Mills, by order of the County of the District of Georgia, whose report has been forwarded to the Officer Department of the South. In close, please find a copy of Albany Daily News, which gives the testimony of citizens of Camilla which was laid before the legislature. It is not believed possible to bring the guilty parties to punishment through the civil authorities of Mitchell County. They being engaged in the affair and justifying it. And no unbiased jury can be found in that county. In close, please find personal letter of Agent Rauschenberg requesting for prudential reasons that his report not be published. It may be how it may, however, be considered as part of this report. And this is going over to page three as part of this report and the opinion of assistant commissioner. I am general, very respectably, your obedient servant. Now, what page two is basically saying is that this bureau is the only one who's trying to bring forth an investigation and find out what happened. Um, no one cares in Camilla. No one's trying to do an investigation or anything like that. However, they feel like it's impossible for them to even do something about what happened or either or to even bring the guilty parties to justice and punish them because the civil authorities are the 
law enforcement and everybody in Camilla, they were engaged on the affair. So they're just as guilty. Not only were they engaged, they're trying to justify the act. And with that being said, they don't feel as if they can find not one unbiased juror within the town of Camilla. So they're reaching out and sending this letter and they also included some extra evidence and all of that good stuff with inside it. They include the personal letter of Agent Rauschenberg. Now, we don't have access to that letter because it seems like that letter is pretty much sealed. However, it shouldn't take all that. It's sad that they were able to just kill all of these people who were coming in peace just to talk. Nothing happened. No one was prosecuted. No one even cared that all of these lies were taken. And with that being said, the saddest part about the whole story is everything was hidden until 1998. And we're going to go into some things that happened when they started electing, when they elected a particular black official and a lot of secrets started coming out when he was trying to get the seat to the key to the city and all of that. We're going to discuss all of that. And also, we're going to discuss what I was talking about in the beginning of the video. Now, this is just my opinion. I don't know for sure yet. I want to put any false information out there because I haven't done my research yet, but I will do my research and there will be a part two. But in my opinion, Camilla has this festival called Nat Day Festival. They have it like I think the first weekend in May and they, I don't know if they still do it, but back in the days when I was growing up, they used to release gnats into the town. And it was always weird to me, why would you want to release a whole bunch of gnats into this town? So now knowing what happened with the Camilla massacre and also knowing how protective they are of the courthouse and their hanging tree in the courthouse. Yes, Camilla has a hanging tree and you can get a felony for messing with that tree. So, but back to the topic. Knowing that they release all of these gnats at this certain time of year and they have this celebration in the same place that this massacre took place. My mind, I'm sorry, y'all, like I said, my mind is a little weird. I think it's out of the box, but my mind immediately goes to they're constantly simulating this death or this massacre because dead bodies and death is going to bring flies, maggots, gnats, you name it, it's going to bring them. So, of course, I'm pretty sure with all of this blood and death in the town, Nets and flies were all throughout this town swarming. So in my mind, I'm thinking that maybe this is their way to keep that tradition going. Bring the nets back. This is the part of the history. Jog the memories of how the town was filled with nets and flies because of the massacre and dead bodies. I don't know. I'm just saying I will find out, however. And once I find out, I will drop you all a video. And it's a very, very, very sad and unfortunate situation that this happened. But there are so many other sad and unfortunate situations in history. We are going to talk about them. I am going to make more videos for you all. But, um, you know, until the, you know, until that time come, you all please like, share, subscribe, support. If you would like to, the information to support will be in the description box below. No pressure. You don't have to. And until next time. Peace, love, and blessings.